Welcome, everybody, to this uh, final session before uh, lunch. Um, we have definitely have two speakers, and the third speaker um, is maybe joining us online, but uh, they're not with us yet, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But we're going to keep this to time anyway. Um, so um, it'll be a, uh, you have 20 minutes to talk. Okay. Um, I'll give you a five-minute warning, and then a, a two-minute warning, and then we'll, we'll see where we go from there. Okay. Um, and we'll do all the, uh, the questions towards the end, because then we'll know how much time we have okay. uh, at the end as well. Um, so, um, very much looking forward to these, uh, these speakers and the presentations broadly in the, in the realm of climate change and plastics. And uh, the first speaker is, is Slobodan Markovic, uh, who's going to talk about Milutin Milankovic and future climate dynamics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my uh, grateful for invitation to participate in this meeting to Professor Neskovic and Professor Popovic. Uh, and I would like today to share you some story about our famous uh, scientist Milutin Milankovic and uh, some, 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 some view of uh, how will develop future climate dynamics. So, let's start. This summer, we witness, witnessed a, a huge heat wave, call it Lucifer. And just to know, by, uh, by the way, the, f the most favorite book of Milutin Milankovic was Faust by Goethe. And uh, uh, this is very, very uh, nice book. And that can help us scientists uh, to, to find our way to serve to the true and to, to not uh, sell our, our souls to the Lucifer. And I hope we will manage it at the end. Opa. Everybody today talks about uh, uh, climate change. Everybody uh, believes that they are qualified. And now we are, have many, many projects like citizen science studies. And uh, most of, of, of everybody have his own um, opinion about climate change. So you can see some popular, popular way of the future climatic interpretations. Excuse me. This way uh, uh, of the concept that uh, uh, humans should adapt to climate change is a little bit egocentric. Everybody of us has some opinion how to do it. But for example, during the, during the evolution of our kind, uh, we, we, we had uh, all, almost all the time continuous adaptations, and these adaptations improve our, our evolution of humans. And I think this is necessary part of the, our life to adapt to some changes of the environment. But very interesting question is why politicians like this question of the climate change? Why this, uh, this uh, topic is very interesting to them? And uh, uh, why I would like to say they like to use this topic in, in the political purposes. Some of them, of course, ignore it. Uh, <laughs> some, some politicians have their own specific style. But usually, most of people uh, care about the future of our planet. But to be fair, the climate change uh, uh, has uh, two different sides. One is cooling phase, and another another phase is warming phase. Or, or and uh, for example, my good friend and very very important scholar in the field of the polar climate research, George Kukla. He was initially Yirji, but when he escaped to United States, he became George. Uh, he wrote a letter uh, with Professor Matthews to President Nixon in 1972. Uh, explaining that uh, our civil civilization should adopt to the climate changes will uh, push our climatic system to the glacial mode. So this is from point of view of uh, uh, changes, climate changes on the glacial interglacial scale, uh, this evolution from cooling phase in 70s to, to, uh, to warming phase in the, in the uh, 
beginning of 21st century is relatively short time, but everybody has right to have opinion. Climate change problem. How we can uh, how, how we can face this 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 problem? How we can solve this problem? How to treat this problem? To treat this problem like scientific problem, for example, conspiracy theory, or like geopolitical potential manipulation. And I think that, as usual, the the best solution should be to treat this problem like scientific problem. What we really know in this, this case, for, we know that for sure Milankovic uh, uh, provides uh, his theory about astronomical causes of the Ice Age, and this is for sure that changes in orbital parameters of the Earth, uh, 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 changing amount of insulation we're receiving from the Sun. This is not, not, this is not a questionable story, and as we can go in the past, we can also uh, calculate these values of the orbital, orbital parameters in the, in the future. So this is not a problem. Another story is related to uh, changes in the greenhouse gases emission to the Earth atmosphere. And in comparison with some previous interglacial, we, we, just to explain, maybe some people don't know, we live in the Holocene era. This is modern or, or, or recent interglacial period. And in the past, we have many interglacial periods similar to the present day conditions, but also we have much cooler glacial phases. And a little bit, a little bit later, we can talk about more about these changes in, in, of CO2 measured by people who are doing ice core studies. But main question and main problem and, and, and need to do in the future is related uh, to measure the, the size of influence of the humans to the, the climate change. Some people are even skeptic that humans do not influence climate, but some people believe that in 50 years, uh, global climate will increase four degrees. Probably both of them, they are not correct. Probably true is in the middle, in, in, the, in the some middle. This is Milutin Milankovic. In his book about his life, autobiography, he say, that serious people have a big belly. So I, I, I want to, be, to pretend that I'm serious, so I improve the size of my body following Milankovic instructions. And uh, you can see orbital parameters, they are, they are heart of Milankovic theory. And for example, in uh, 1976 was published famous uh, paper in, in science uh, published by uh, Jim Hayes, John Imbri, and Nick Shackleton. They call it uh, uh, this, this paper, uh, Milankovic Cycles, Pacemakers of the Ice Age. So this, this, this kind of revolutionary paper, again, proved that Milankovic theory works. And we can see, for example, we have changes of orbital parameters in insulation on 65 degree north uh, for 800,000 years in the past. And also, we are today in, in, at zero, but we also can easily calculate, not easily, but relatively easily can calculate these parameters for the next 800,000 years. So, Milankovic uh, forcing uh, to the climate is clear. That, that's uh, happened in the past, but that will also happen in the future. Ice cores. This is... This is an incredible story. People, uh, if you want to have uh, evidence of the pure climate, you should move from the place that you have a, a very complicated environment. So the best archives of, of the polar climate is preserved in the floor of deep sea, of the oceans, and also in the ice, far from any different influence. And can you imagine, for example, uh, people, people drilled thousands of meters of this course. For example, very famous uh, Epica Dome C core in the Antarctica has 3,700 3, meters already reaching the rock, base rock in the, in the floor of, of the Antarctic continent. They found many incredible paleoclimatic stories, but maybe the most exciting story 
is related to these bubbles in the ice cores. You can see these small bubbles. Uh, scientists, in, especially in Grenoble, they are Jim Jouzel and Dominique Reynaud, they use this air. They took with very precise equipment the air and measured the, 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 the content of the ancient atmosphere. Because they can, they, they can uh, make very precise uh, time scales. We, we have evidence, chronological evidence of these cores, but also we, they found uh, somehow trapped, trapped uh, uh, atmosphere remnants in the ice cores. So the results, this is, this is, for example, if we have time machine and we sit in the time machine, we can go far to the, the, the past and also take into account that this time scale is not linear. This is first in the hundred of millions of years, ten of the million years, millions of years, thousand, uh, and, and last million years has hundreds of thousands of years, and finally we have just uh, thousands of years. And just to know and to have impression, this yellow line showing present day climate our status of the climate. So you can see almost last 590 years, million years, climate was more hot on the, on the, on the global scale. So also in this time, life pres preserved. But problem is because we, our adaptations may be not be enough, enough uh, good to survive such dramatic changes of, of, of the environment. But some, some life will, will survive for sure, but maybe we will not be included to the list. So, uh, also I like to show, so we, this is last, last 12,000 years, we call it this, this era Holocene. And now we have a very popular term Anthropocene for the last, I don't know, 100 or how many years. That, that when, when we believe that this is again an egocentric style of thinking, that we believe that we crucially change environmental conditions on, on, on our planet. And now we, we, uh, we can see, for example, the last interglacial period, call it Imian, about uh, 130,000 years ago, was much, much more hot than, than present day. For example, uh, uh, level of the sea was six meters higher than today. And about six meters higher level of the sea, that means all, all present ice on the Greenland, for example. For example, if, if all ice will melt on the Antarctica, sea level rise will increase about 66 meters. So, uh, I'd like to show you also the more detailed story these last, last 12,000 years. This is the era of Holocene, and you can see we are here. We have some increase of the temperatures, also increase of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. But majority of Holocene was m more hot than today, warmer, that, that, that were warmer periods. I don't want to judge who is right, but problem is, what, i what, is, uh, what is the problem? We have emission of the CO2 and the methane uh, to the atmosphere, Ma as we don't have any, any uh, previous geological analog for that. So we don't know how nature will react to, 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 to these, changes of, uh, these changes of composition of the planet, uh, planet's uh, atmosphere. This is like this, for example. To, just to explain this, uh, this is concentration of CO2 from Epicadome C core, Mil configuration of the changes of orbital parameters by Milankovic. Uh, this is uh, uh, ice volume on the global scale, and you can see, once 400,000 years ago, uh, by na by naturally, level of the CO2 increased. You can see that peaks of in previous interglacials have a higher concentration of CO2 than interglacials before. But now we have some additional problem. Uh, if if CO2 level concentration in the atmosphere stay like to, like like was in the natural in the natural level. We will probably soon that soon means in few thousands of years will face 
enter to the climatic shift and probably start of the new ice phase, new, 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 new ice age phase, new glacial period. But we have some anomaly, and we have probably, or not probably, anthropogenic caused serious increase of the CO2. And we don't know how climatic system will react to, react to these un, un, so-called unknown conditions for the clima, uh, climatic system. So we don't know that we will have prolonged interglacial period, so anomalously long interglacial period, or we can have even more problematic situation that we have superglacial conditions, that we have something which we never uh, experienced in, in, in the Earth's history. So, we, thanks. we need to think about energy balance of our planet because the most, the most important source for the increasing of the CO2 emission is related to the human activities. So we're receiving just symbolic part of the energy sun, uh, sun producing. And also, uh, all, all energy coming from the sun, which uh, uh, is consolidated in the Earth atmosphere, is 6.5 6, uh, 6 thousand times less than all energy we produce in our planet. So we need the more efficient and ecologically friendly energetical sources on the global scale. We, we have now enormous amount of the money invested to so-called green policy, including related so-called green scientific projects. But this is something like, uh, like colleague from, uh, from Tel Aviv said, this is just temporal solution. Just, this is just way how to make problems smaller. But for really solutions, we need better strategies. We need to have uh, 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 more efficient solutions. For example, unfortunately, the war in Ukraine showing us how, how much we depend on this energetic uh, uh, agenda today. And this is huge. We hope that um, insulation will help us, that we, don't, we, that we can have middle, middle winter and we can more easily survive. Okay. The problem is, does present society, based on the likes, our society, depending on the likes on, on, on uh, social networks, does, does this uh, society, which uh, ranking human values based on number of the likes of some people, has potential to make this adequate future scientific and technological proce process a progress, excuse me, to solve this problem. For example, like story from 70s about global cooling. In, in, in 80s, we have uh, media terror related to the ozone hole. And, and we don't know really what's, what's going on. Uh, you can check on the internet, there exist some, some stories about ozone hole. You can check if you're interested to see does this hole is bigger or smaller or keep same size. And so we need, we need solutions. We, not, we need to care about our adaptations, but we need solutions. And these solutions should be related to the physics and associated uh, uh, sciences, because we need first to understand Earth climate system to provide more efficient global energy. And one of solutions is cosmic programs. We need cosmic programs to manage situation conditions to, uh, to establish extraterrestrial colonizations conditions, because this is one of the most important ways how to survive in the next several thousand years our, our civilization. Okay, also this is very important relation between decision makers and the scientists. This, is, this nexus is always a problem. And finally, we need to escape from this style of energy supply related to the fire. Last 35,000 years, we, uh, we dominantly use energy based on fire. So we need to change these things. We need to improve these conditions. For, for example, also 
we need good strategies. Question, why is good to have cooler earth or, or, or warmer earth? For example, can you imagine if we shift again to the Ice Age uh, uh, climatic mode, many people moving to Canada will back to us because Canada will be completely covered by ice. Is it really good situation for, the, for the, our civilization or not? We need more complex uh, uh, debates and also good strategies for the future. How to solve really? Because uh, we, we, we need to see this story from many different angles. And also, as a last question, do you know who are these boys? The first one was born in 1879 and was called Milutin. His family name is Milankovic. The second was born in, 90, in 1880, was called Alfred, and his family name is Wegener. They met only once in their lives, but both they changed earth, earth uh, sciences forever. They, two so-called heretic theories, completely changed opinion about geosciences in the global scale. Yes, and, and finally, you can see, uh, there we, we are now know that they, are, they were right. Their theories are completely right. But their contemporaries, they didn't believe to that. They were too, too re revolutionary for this time. And the main question is, because many things, they, they took several dec decades to prove their, their, their theories. Lessons from the history of science Putting us important question, can we recognize actual revolutionary research? Are we able to see it? And slide, this is last slide, really last slide. <laughs> uh, the main question is how to separate trivial from the real scientific achievements in the age of the hyper production of scientific papers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a fascinating study of the, uh, of the relationship between the history and moving into the future on a, on a, on a significant timescale. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Anastasia Makareva, um, uh, and she's going to talk about ba basic science to clarify the climate regulating function of the world's pristine forests. Water is the key. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak in this, um, on this very interesting and important conference. And uh, I work in the theoretical physics division in Petersburg Nuclear Physics Institute, and I also represent Institute for Advanced Studies, Technical University of Munich, where I work in the research group on draft mitigation via ecosystem restoration challenges and opportunities. And uh, <clears throat> I am, uh, as a theoretical physicist, I additionally have a, what can be looked at as somewhat unusual background because I spent like more than five years of my life uh, in field trips in natural ecosystems of Russia monitoring forest ecosystems. So I would like today to share my <coughs> perspective uh, which combines this expertise of uh, theorists who deal with uh, the role of ecosystems in atmospheric dynamics and with the expertise of um, first-hand knowledge of how these ecosystems really work. <coughs> uh, so um, if we look at uh, those processes that uh, shape uh, what we refer to as climate change, which is the source of our concerns, so we have we have um, two uh, related but distinct processes. And one is the change of carbon cycle. This is what we mostly refer to, and uh, this is what we are more focused uh, on. And uh, you can see on this slide that um, uh, currently there is a lot of uh, emissions from fossil fuel burning and just a little bit uh, like one tenth uh, or something uh, from land use change. At the same time, we also know that there has been a very radical transformation of the biosphere 
in the recent uh, century, which has led um, us to the condition where <clears throat> primary vegetation was exterminated on most part of uh, land and was replaced by agricultural systems which act very differently. And so uh, from, from these two graphs, and especially from the left one, it, it appears that at the moment land use change is of a minor concern compared to fossil fuel emissions. Likewise, we have these two processes and we have two uh, disturbing aspects of climate change, which is the rise of global temperature with all its negative uh, impacts on our civilization. But at the same time, it is not a global uh, pattern, but increasing frequency and amplitude of weather extremes like droughts, floods, and heat waves. And <clears throat> it is not... Uh, it is not an easy problem to answer uh, how these two are actually related. So basic science uh, uh, is key to our approaching these two issues. And um, regarding the rise of global temperature, um, Professor Svantarinius was the first to estimate the rise of global temperature due to uh, uh, CO2 uh, change in the atmosphere. And I can tell you that it was uh, this paper published in 1896 uh, was really a very fine uh, basic research uh, combining uh, uh, up-to-date science and how he calculated it. You can see that this is the graph of temperature, vertical uh, profile of temperature, and um, <clears throat> the Earth uh, radiative temperature, it is how much our Earth emits to radiation to space, is 20, uh, 225, and it is approximately level located somewhat above 5 kilometers. So from here, uh, the Earth emits effective radiative radiation to space. So uh, Arrhenius calculated that if we increase the CO2 circle, uh, concentration, so the upper radiative level will move up, and then we will have to match the incoming solar radiation. The surface temperature will have to rise. And this led him to a very accurate and still uh, more or less up-to-date estimate that CO2 doubling results in four to five Kelvin of warming. And now, uh, these results were not considered uh, till 1960, but then uh, with the development of uh, global climate models, uh, these models that are now run of, on supercomputers were built around this basic estimate of how our planetary temperature responds to uh, CO2 increase. And these models uh, are built originally in um, scientific centers, and now there are few, uh, many of them, like more than several dozens. And their performance and their comparison uh, serves to inform us about the uncertainty of our climate projections. Uh, imagine that in each center, models are tuned to reproduce the um, um, observed record of temperature rise and um, some other parameters. And uh, people use different parameterizations. So when we combine the models together, like in this uh, coupled model in the comparison project, their mean performance, like here you can see how they reproduce the model mean, how it reproduces the glo mean global temperature, has several Mm, deviations from the observations. Like, for example, here you can see that uh, temperature, sea surface temperature uh, near South America is overestimated by mm, more than five degrees. And these results in very uh, um, widely different projections uh, regarding the climate change. Here you can see um, several models, uh, so this is the range of models, and, and this is the temperature, the temperature graph, how much warming they predict. 
And here you can see the blue is a more or less stable prediction uh, due to uh, radiative effects of CO2, which I referred to, which are Renyon's quantified. It turns out to be about two uh, half of what he quantified, but anyway. But these are uh, feedbacks. This is albedo, the red one, and this means that when, for example, the ice shields melt, uh, so, and there is bare land, it consumes, uh, it absorbs more sunlight, so the planet warms. And you can see that these feedbacks range widely between the models. And there are also clouds, this, this one. And clouds also, uh, the cloud feedback is very uncertain and contributes about three degrees of uncertainty between these models. So this is how the situation stand. So all these models are realistic in, that, in the sense that they reproduce the trend uh, of temperature and many other characteristics of the Earth system, but different ones. <clears throat> so now, uh, what about the second process? When we transform uh, native vegetation, like this is a boreal forest in Russia, uh, and we have a lot of uh, such forests still, and the red shows how they are being destroyed, into something different. When we deforest, when we desertify previously vegetated land, uh, lots of things happen. First of all, the transpiration, the um, process is disrupted, and so the ecosystem doesn't, uh, um, doesn't uh, provide uh, water vapor to the atmosphere. And also you can see that the albedo changes, so the, um, if we compare to this, uh, the forest is dark, so it is, absorbs more, and the desert is uh, bright, it uh, absorbs less solar radiation. So, how does it uh, can be factored in uh, to uh, what impact it can have on uh, climate, on uh, global temperature? Here you can see uh, 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 the scheme which shows how the greenhouse effect works. And if we have greenhouse gases, which radi uh, radiate in, in, in all directions and reflect some, um, re-emit some thermal radiation back to, back to the Earth, so we can see that radiation of the Earth uh, increases compared to the case of no greenhouse gases. Now, when we have uh, ecosystems which transpire uh, water vapor, this water vapor is transported by convection and passes the uh, main level with absorbers, and it, em it is emitted more directly to space, and in this sense, uh, we have cooling. So, so not all uh, solar radiation is, which is converted to thermal radiation is uh, captured by greenhouse gases, but some escapes to the upper levels from which it goes unimpeded to space. So this, this is the cooling effect of having uh, transpiring ecosystems. And we can uh, have a zero order estimate, uh, like um, uh, um, at the same level of, um, or similar level of complexity as Arrhenius did, and uh, from uh, the known uh, uh, areas where like forests were destroyed, and knowing the power of transpiration and the magnitude of greenhouse effect, we can estimate this cooling, and it turns out of the same magnitude as from the observed CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere. So from basic estimates, we know that it is not a negligible factor. But how is it incorporated in current models? In current global climate models, they confirm this zero order basic estimate. Because uh, 
they show the this transpirational cooling from historical warming from historical uh, deforestation is around one Kelvin uh, globally. But in these models, this uh, warming from deforestation due to this destruction of the cool cooling mechanism is accurately offset by the change of albedo. As I showed to you, the forest was dark, then there is a desert. I am simplifying, of course. And so in the models, it, these two independent ev uh, effects are tuned such that they accurately cancel each other. Uh, so we uh, cannot, um, so, so, and this forms this uh, idea that actually land use change, which is ongoing, we know that the Amazon is under threat, that the borough forests are under threat, that uh, native forests are disappearing and are being replaced by plantations, this boy, uh, poses no threat because the models are built in this manner. However, if we return a few slides, looking at the uncertainty in these models, we can see that even between these models, the uncertainty in albedo change, you see these red, uh, red uh, bars, is very large. For example, this lower is a Russian model. It doesn't have any albedo feedback. And here, uh, some other models in uh, like Hadley Center, the albedo feedback is around one Kelvin. So, it, and we know that currently all our warming is about one Kelvin. So how can we be sure that such an uncertain thing as albedo compensates so neatly another unknown thing, uh, which is transpirational cooling? Besides, Again, as I said, there is a huge uncertainty with clouds, up to two Kelvin for CO2 doubling. So, and, and we know that native vegetation and vegetation in generally does affect cloud formation in very profound way, ways. Here you can see uh, the f figure from a very famous study, which is called um, uh, native uh, uh, cloud cover prefers native vegetation. And this is in Australia. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so, for the cloud cover, we also, we also don't know. It is the most uncertain uh, element of the climate system. So, we don't know how it changed when we replaced native forests that have evolved uh, to be resilient with what we have now. This is another thing. And finally, uh, yes, uh, and so now most recent research shows that when we factor in uh, the cloud cover effects that forests have, previous conclusions like those of the IPCC that forests don't matter for global um, uh, temperature change because of this uh, compensation between albedo and transpiration cooling are being radically reconsidered. So when we, we just begin to study this cloud uh, cover effects of forests and immediately we come to serious reconsideration of uh, what we thought about this before. And another thing I briefly tell you that um, this cooling effect of forests is also related to atmospheric moisture transfer because you can see here, if uh, there is a convection and latent heat release somewhere up in the troposphere, this um, process of um, thermal emission to space doesn't occur immediately. It has a certain uh, time scale. And the air must remain in the upper troposphere for a long while. And it, must, uh, it, it, it will be then transported during this time uh, somewhere, and then it will be able to give away 
uh, heat. So, and if we look at the models, again, we can see that they don't capture the atmospheric moisture transport. And the, here, the most important thing is the Amazon basin, which is one quarter of global runoff and moisture transport, and it is underestimated by half. So this process of long distance transport is underestimated in models. And this again will cause an underestimate of the cooling effect of uh, natural ecosystems. So what does it mean for our, for today, or our concerns of today? We are considering exploiting forest biomass as a clean energy, renewable energy. But, yeah, yeah I'm finishing. But is it uh, so if uh, by destroying forests we uh, do something uh, quite opposite, we should reconsider these policies. And um, what um, uh, I would like to propose, uh, now the main, there is a mainstream effort to further uh, perfect those historical models that focus on CO2. So if somebody comes and say, oh, re let us reparameterize uh, re them to show an alternative explanation, that will be very difficult because it will be against the consensus. So those actors in global change agenda who are interested in that we have a, a reliable estimate of uncertainties in our climate projections. I think that they should come up with the initiative of a crash test to our climate projections. We do not compare between models that already are there, but task experts with the challenge to produce an alternative model which will explain the same data from an alternative uh, position, as I outlined, because there are all objective grounds for that. And free them from pressure from the mainstream, allow them to be controversial, and, and see what they will be able to achieve. And if they don't achieve that, and okay, we cannot produce a viable model explaining the same as CO2 model, focus models explain. Okay. It is very good result. Then we are on the right path. I uh, don't think we are. But anyway, we will destroy native forests and replace them with plantations, and biomass will be our pillar of renewable energy. But if they do produce a viable model, this will mean that it is very, uh, we are on a dangerous crossroad. So we shouldn't rely on the biomass and we should preserve native, still existing native ecosystems as much as possible. So it is very important. And we are on a very important moment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. That was a, a really well explained, even for somebody who's not from a science background, explanation of the complexity of what you're talking about, leading to some really profound questions about reframing potentially how we think about things. So thank you very much. Um, do we have, we have the third speaker. Okay, wonderful. Um, Tanya, hopefully you can hear us here and um, uh, I'm going to give you 20 minutes for your talk, and uh, uh, I'll give you a five-minute warning and a two-minute warning. We need to finish on time. Um, over to you, Tanya. Thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing your, your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll hopefully share my um, presentation without any problems. I hope you can see the presentation. Yeah, we can see that screen. fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, the, um, the talk uh, that uh, I, I'm going to um, give today during this uh, very important and very interesting conference, conference on the role of basic sciences for the sustainable development 
is about micro and nanoplastics in um, food and environment. So I suppose it fits in, in the session that is discussing uh, how we humans uh, can impact the, the environment around us and how we can more or less can change uh, the, the planet. Uh, well, first, I would like to uh, briefly uh, introduce the concept and what is uh, microplastics in case uh, you have not heard about uh, in the details, uh, the um, microplastics is composed of several polymers uh, that are uh, in everyday use. Uh, uh, these, these polymers come uh, with different uh, chemical uh, structures and compositions and can be most often are also fortified with different additives. Tanya, that come Tanya stabilizers. Just, could you go full, is it possible to go full screen on your slide so we can get the... You, Let me see. Uh, you you can, cannot see the full uh, so you screen. Go slideshow and you choose from beginning and then so we can see the whole uh, slides. I'm very sorry. It looks like I'm in a presentation mode in my screen. Let me let me try to fix. Yeah, so you need to actually choose the the from beginning on on the uh, on the screen. We can't we can see it, but we can only see it fairly small. Sure. That's the one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's, Sorry, it's still it's not it's not it's not connected yet. It's not connected yet. Keep keep going. We'll we'll um, we'll we'll pick this up. So yes, if you can just make it as big as you can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the uh, different additives uh, uh, get added uh, to the polymers and can can make uh, these uh, chemical composition quite complex. Uh, on the other hand, the microplastics also come and can be found in around us as a primary, already manufactured as micro microplastics and secondary meaning that it is a degradation product of already existing uh, plastic uh, litter in the environment. Uh, depending on, on, on the size of the, these uh, particles uh, that are present, uh, we can um, uh, define also micro and nanoplastics as, as plastics being smaller than five millimeters and nanoplastics being smaller than 0 0.1 uh, micrometer. Uh, they also uh, come in different shapes uh, with fragments and, and fibers uh, being uh, most frequently found in the, um, uh, in the environment. Uh, the uh, nanoplastic uh, has recently come into, into focus because, uh, because of a uh, very small size, these nanoplastic uh, materials also uh, behave in a very unique way and uh, uh, yet yeah, for instance they have colloidal uh, behavior that's why they are recognized as a subcategory category of microplastics and they are specially studied uh, in addition to uh, the complexity of all uh, materials that micro nanoplastics are composed with and the shapes they come um, also um, um, uh, as well as being primary or secondary in a way changed by the environment. Uh, we can also say that uh, for uh, um, the uh, full characterization as, as analytical chemists, as we would like to know of, uh, of nanoplastics, we still do not have uh, suitable methods. Um, when identifying and characterizing microplastics from, from different uh, 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 tissues or extracted from different environments, we have a set of methods that we can apply to fully characterize shape, size, uh, as well as chemical, not without uh, difficulties. But for the uh, nanoplastics, uh, also some microplastics, uh, we still have a lot of methodological issues that adds to the complexity of this. Uh, this is a, a very Tanya, relevant Tanya, can topic. I just check we're on the correct slide? We're on slide two, is that correct? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, moving forward. Hmm? Um, no, uh, well, what we know all about plastics it, it is that it is durable, that it is practically uh, very resistant to uh, degradation. 
um, once it's released into the environment, it's going to stay practically forever. Uh, it means that all the plastic litter that is uh, now, now in the environment, unless it is somehow treated, will remain and will accumulate. Uh, microplastics uh, itself, being the definition product of uh, megaplastics, or, or being uh, simply uh, released as a primary microplastics, uh, manufactured in a small size, is more difficult to be uh, removed from the environment simply because if you are going through, through the net, if you are going to physically remove all this litter. And uh, the estimates uh, um, are that uh, there will be definitely an exponential growth of, of microplastics uh, particles uh, in the environment, such as in, 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 in oceans. Uh, so, uh, an estimate is that at the moment there are more uh, trillions of microplastics circulating, and also for the nanoplastics and the range of uh, environmental exposure to nanoplastics, we also do not have uh, uh, solid data. Uh, the, this topic is, of course, of, um, um, of interest to the wide public, and every time there is a a significant discovery in the field of microplastics, uh, there is a lot of public interest. You don't have to be a scientist and to read scientific papers. Uh, you can simply get uh, informed about the recent developments by looking at the magazines. Um, and uh, from the, even from the magazines, you can learn that the microplastics uh, pollution is now practically everywhere, not only in the oceans. But uh, microplastics is found in snow on the top of Mount Everest, in, in rain in uh, Siberia. Uh, it's also uh, found in a placenta of unborn babies, uh, both from maternal and from the fetal side. Uh, the, the plastic particles are, uh, are also quite recent, studies show, found in uh, human blood uh, for the first time. Uh, this is, of course, a uh, very disturbing uh, news for everyone. You don't have to be a scientist to ask yourself a reasonable question. Uh, well, if we are, according to this very recent study that has showed microplastics in human blood, if we in our blood have something around 0.1% um, of plastics in blood, uh, what does it do there? Can it, uh, um, can it, can it, can it's simply like not the place for plastic material to be. Uh, so how are we going to, to deal with this? What do we know about uh, health effects of, of, of uh, the microbiotic plastics? I have to say that we practically do not know much. And uh, it is, uh, in fact, uh, 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 the, um, the research on uh, the microplastics and our exposure, uh, and our exposure to microplastics is, is very recent research. And uh, the, the uh, field of uh, health effects of microplastics and nanoplastics is also very recent, so not many data. I will of course show some of them. Uh, for instance, uh, I also wanted to a little bit describe how um, the methodologically the, the issue of nanoplastic identification in blood was solved. Uh, of course, everyone uh, will put a very reasonable question. Well, plastics is everywhere. How can you be sure that what you uh, have seen and detected in blood and placenta is not a contamination coming from the air, coming from the um, a handling of, uh, of the material itself. Of course, this is a very reasonable, uh, a reasonable question, and every study published in the field of microplastics is always a little bit talking, but, but that, like, you know, quality control uh, pact. Uh, of course, uh, there is a lot of quality control samples and controls that have to be done uh, for, 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 for uh, like, any study in the field of microplastics. You usually detect one or two uh, particles in a, in a tissue of, let's say, uh, a seafood, clam, oysters, etc. So, of course, you need to be very sure that you, you work in a in, in clean environment and that all uh, controls and likes, etc. 
For this specific case, uh, samples of uh, blood donors uh, taken, taken from um, uh, uh, with a nine or with a diameter of uh, uh, five uh, uh, microns, and then um, uh, subject to filtration to collect because the nanoplastics uh, has to be concentrated somehow to be analyzed. As, as I have already said, there are no easy methods to, to detect and chemically characterize nanoplastics. So these authors combined filtration and a chemical characterization by pyrolysis GCMS. So in, in, in the extraction step, they have to uh, use special filters and also to concentrate all these samples down to very uh, few uh, micrograms because the the cell that is put in the instrument is very small, so the filtration had to go for a specially designed filter. It's quite interesting because indeed it was the first study that showed that there, there are plastic materials in the blood. They analyzed 22 donors and in most of them different polymers have found uh, uh, there is a, a bit of in consistency in between replicate measurements. Uh, let's say uh, in most of the duplicate measurements, the uh, uh, limit of quantitation or limit of even limit of detection was not detected. Uh, it could be that the, the blood is not a, a homogeneous sample. So simply if there is only one plastic particle um, in, 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 in 10 milliliters of blood, simply uh, speaking, that will be sufficient to be detected by the method, but it's only one particle that's present in one sample, but not in the other. Anyhow, uh, it's, uh, it is, uh, as I said, kind of boring. Uh, what are the main sources of microplastics? When it comes to uh, microplastics in, uh, in, in oceans and sea, we know that the main sources are uh, textiles, synthetic textiles. Around one third of the microplastics in the ocean come from these uh, synthetic uh, fabrics, such as polyester, whose uh, other major contributors are car tires and city dust. How can we get exposed to microplastics? Um, and in order to estimate the risk to something, you need to, to fill up uh, the puzzle. From one side, you need to know the exposure, and from the other side, you need to, to to, to know about the hazards. And uh, for uh, a proper estimate of the risk uh, assessment to micro nanoplastics, um, uh, we cannot do much because the, there is a lack of studies on chronic exposure to micro plastics as, as well as lack, lack of data uh, on toxicity of aged microplastics. We have a lot of in vitro data on toxicity of manufactured naive microplastics, but the data on the microplastics that got exposed to the environment and aged in a way that uh, has uh, uh, changed chemically uh, are lacking. Of course, we know that if we can get exposed to microplastics through skin inhalation and ingestion, uh, with the, of course, ingestion being the most interesting uh, exposure uh, route, uh, uh, we know that one of the richest sources of microplastics uh, uh, in food comes, in fact, from food packaging, uh, such as uh, brewing uh, uh, temperature of, of your tea will release a lot of uh, microplastics in tea, mostly nylon and pet. We also know that uh, uh, microplastics has been found in food additives, drinking water, beverages, but it also got incorporated into the food chain. Quite recently, it showed that uh, these microplastics are found in milk, meat, blood, eggs. Tanya, we're still on slide two. You need to close presenter view. Can you do uh, that? Okay. Uh, you can't really do you see think this is better? I'm very sorry. It's okay, but we need... Yeah. I'm very sorry, I really do not understand. You, need, uh, you either need to click on the slides. Yeah, you need to either click on the slides on the left or close presenter view. Or just, you can just talk it through with us if you prefer, but we... Yeah, it's uh, actually good to see something.
That's okay. Maybe go back to how you had it, but just make sure you're clicking on the slides on the left as you move down. Can you do that? Maybe you could just talk us through. We are running out of time, so um, just talk yeah, us through. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, and just make no, sure you it's click. sharing. On. Yeah, it, it it's not fully sharing, but as long as you click on the left hand side, we'll see them. Um, yes, but, yes. So it's, it's, we, say, uh, we only have about five minutes left. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank yeah. You. Thank you. So I'm coming to the end. Uh, no problem. Anyway. Thank, thank you. Uh, Thanks. Uh, sorry. Uh, so we also have uh, direct evidence of human exposure, and we want to know what's going on with these microparticles. For instance, uh, uh, regarding the faint, smaller particles, for sure, they can really access to all organs in, uh, in our body. They can also translocate through blood, brain, placental barrier, the nanoplastics. When it comes to the uh, absorption of uh, microplastics of so the size larger than 50 micrometers, uh, they practically cannot be absorbed through the gastrointestinal intestinal tract. Uh, of course, important issue about microplastics is that they can absorb a lot of contaminants, including heavy metals, uh, microorganisms, and proteins, and serve as a carrier into the body. Uh, the fact is, uh, uh, there are allergenic proteins uh, that can uh, get absorbed to the microplastics and in this way get into, uh, into, into the body and uh, uh, get into touch with the immune system. And this is an uh, uh, important uh, uh, research part uh, for, 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 our, for, for our look how the allergenic proteins and microplastics can interact and how they can uh, in certain, is there any synergy between this interaction and the output? We also, we also know, know that infants are uh, highly exposed to micro-nanoplastics that come from, from food packaging. In fact, more, more than, than 10 times than, times than uh, uh, in adults, uh, uh, SSS, we found uh, 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 microplastics, meaning that, that there is an urgent need to uh, assess the uh, risks of the exposure to this. Uh, especially infants. Uh, the uh, uh, microplastics analysis in food uh, is quite complex. It requires the digestion, extraction, counting of the particles, uh, uh, the description of the morphology and the chemical characterization. And uh, we have shown that uh, uh, looking uh, uh, at the simplest matters that are most often in use for biological material is not very uh, convenient because there is an uh, under, uh, underestimate. There is an overestimation of the uh, particles uh, due, due to the present biological uh, materi material. Uh, there is also a, a, a lack of standardization of methodology for a shape characterization in the microplastics. There is still a lot of manual uh, uh, classification, and those could be improved using specific image recognition softwares because for the exposure modeling, fibers, plastics, and spheres must be separately modeled. Of course, uh, regarding the health effects of these particles in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, we were mostly interested in uh, the digestion. You have for two instance, minutes. No, yeah, thanks. Uh, we know that uh, the, the microplastics can inhibit rapid digestion. Uh, for the protein digestion in fish, there are certain inhibitions of digestion, but in in vitro uh, uh, experiments in uh, 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 simulated conditions in which the microplastics uh, exposure was much much higher than uh, 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 in uh, in the natural environment, uh, we have modeled. Uh, we tried to model the. Uh, 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 exposure uh, uh, that is relevant for um, the air daily consumption of microplastics and we match the um, uh, higher uh, than 100 times exposure we did observe binding of digestive enzymes to polystyrene microbeads but we did not observe a significant effect on the activity of this enzyme in uh, conditions that are relevant for the exposure. 
uh, meaning that uh, we need a lot of additional um, uh, experiments and studies to conduct to make sure that what we can measure and what we can prove in our uh, research uh, really reflects uh, the uh, uh, real exposure, the realistic scenario exposure. Many thanks, of course, to uh, my team uh, and also to the uh, funding uh, received for, for our research. I, I, I'm, I'm very, very sorry, sorry for, for these technical, technical um, difficulties. Um, that that will be all. all. Thank, Thank you for your attention. And, uh, Thank you. We'll happy. Thank you. Please, please stay with us. Thank you. Yes, I have some sympathies, Tanya, because I find PowerPoint presentation and sharing slides almost as complex as microplastics itself. So uh, um, thank you. Thank you for bearing with us and for, for speeding things up at the end. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, so we do have time for some uh, questions. So uh, who would like to ask the first question? We'll go here and then we'll go here afterwards. Thank you. Uh, question for Professor Markovic. Uh, according to the Milankovic theory, uh, do you have a pre uh, idea about temperatures in the next uh, uh, few hundred years? Uh, according to Milankovic theory, uh, first, to, first of all, I, I need to explain uh, the, how they say, time scales. Milankovic calculations for Milankovic installation curves are each 1,000 years. So uh, somehow, uh, we are uh, uh, next next few hundred years is inside of this one unit of, of, of uh, insulation curve uh, presentation, so we don't expect based on Milankovic theory any significant changes in the next few years. But in the next two, two or three thousand years, we will receive less uh, insulation than today. So uh, uh, somehow uh, an energy budget will be. Uh, not like today, and we will receive less energy, but what will happen in the very complicated Earth atmosphere system, we don't know. We are still, unfortunately, people financing us, but we don't have really answer. Great, thank you. Um, is this question for somebody else? Yeah, great, thank you. Question for uh, Anastasia. Anastasia, thank you. Uh, so the question, um, so you pointed out that uh, when uh, the vegetation changes, the cloud formation above changes. Um, but of course, uh, in, in some ways, yes, intuitively, it, it can be related. But uh, the cloud formation is uh, kind of uh, an effect of many other kind of events, you know, the, the currents in the atmosphere, uh, the time of the year and so on. So um, do we have uh, models uh, that we can uh, model that? Um, or, uh, are, you know, because of course we don't, uh, you probably need uh, like long-term observation data from satellites. Uh, and I don't think we have that many going back to many years. Maybe 50 years from now, we will. So what, uh, tools we have to do that and what studies have been made to verify that. Yeah. Th th thank you for your question. Uh, first, I would like to say that uh, indeed we don't have a long record of uh, clouds, and, uh, but uh, still um, uh, clouds are uh, included into global climate models. So, so they are part of those climate projections that we are discussing. And in this sense, they are as critical for CO2-focused projections as they are for ecosystem-based uh, projections. And um, uh, uh, what kind of data we need? Uh, we need um, large-scale observations uh, where we would um, mm, show the connection between ecosystem functioning and cloud formation. And I can tell you uh, that such uh, studies are being done. And for the Amazon forest, it is already since 2017 that it is known that uh, transpiration of the uh, Amazon forest uh, by moistening the atmosphere serves to promote 
uh, cloud formation and then even the uh, moisture transport from the Atlantic. Uh, and this occurs uh, uh, at the background of uh, uh, geophysical conditions that are not favorable for the wet season formation because because geophysically, uh, wet season comes after the migration of the intertropical convergence zones. You know, we have this precipitation maximum uh, at the equator, which migrates seasonally. So if you look at the globe, when it comes, it is normally wet. And this has nothing to do with ecosystems. This is just uh, geophysics, right? How our planet is organized. But in the Amazon, due to this transpiration, which is uh, and the source that it is transpiration, it is also tricky. Uh, you need to measure it somehow, and it was measured by isotopic composition because there is isotopic fractionation uh, of the water vapor that is transpired compared to evaporated from the ocean. So this transpiration uh, moistens the atmosphere, changes the dynamics because hum humid atmosphere has a different dynamics than dry atmosphere. And this causes really uh, transcontinental processes. What we are missing uh, badly are similar studies for the uh, Eurasian forest belt, which matters crucially for European weather and uh, for Chinese water cycle. And this is what we do need, because here the situation is even more complex because there are cyclones coming, so, so we need to study how uh, forests influence cyclone formation and their intensity. Uh, so, uh, um, so this is what we need, and this should be uh, combined with uh, studies on the ground. With, uh, so this is, uh, this is really a challenge. But, but, but this well, meant, yeah. I think we'll have to leave it yeah. there. Maybe you can yeah, continue yeah, yeah. that conversation. Um, I'd like to see, is there any other questions for Tanya? See if we can, uh, a short question for Tanya. Tanya, I, I have a question. Just, I, I'm, I'm just very curious around um, where we're at in terms of being able to identify some very significant solutions around uh, sort of microplastics. Are, are there any out there? Is there any, any hope that we have to be able to tackle some of this? Uh, if you could be brief in your answer, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, at least in the EU, uh, we think uh, about regulating uh, uh, production of uh, primary microplastics and the release. Of, uh, they, they, they also consider uh, measures against uh, non-intentionally released microplastics in the environment. That could help. Of course, these are not the main contributors to the, the problem of microplastics in the environment, that, but for sure can, can help. Great. I, I, I hope that that was... Thank you very, very much. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, that's it. We're, we're going for lunch, but I'd just like to give a very uh, warm thanks to our, our fantastic speakers who've explained their issues very clearly and, um, uh, uh, and very diverse and interesting topics. Thank you very much. Thank you.